Welcome back to the third day of AUSA. I'm Jen Judson, land warfare reporter for Defense News, and we're here with the Honorable Doug Bush, mm -hmm. who is in charge of Army acquisition. Um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about what's coming up. Sure. Um, you know, you have been driving uh, towards an Army of 2030, a modernized mm -hmm. Army of 2030, lots of programs that you yep. uh, are in charge of to get to that point. Um, you've hit a lot of really great milestones uh, in the past couple of years, especially this thing. Yep. Almost 24 systems yep. uh, by the end yep. of 2023 in the hands of soldiers. Yep. So what are uh, some of the big moments that you're watching for sure. in 2024? So one is um, making sure we continue momentum. So some of what we did in 23 was still somewhat small scale in terms of you know initial prototypes or first fieldings. Um, we've got to now do in some ways a lot the harder part, which is scale, um, to actually start deploying entire units worth of stuff, do all the sustainment planning, all the things that come behind kind of sometimes the fun part yeah. <laughs> of designing a new technology and seeing if it works. Yeah. The the rest of the story is, um, is uh, for example, sustainment, making sure that the whole the whole system now supports units with equipment. So even on things like AMPV, which is now in full rate production, well, part of that is that supply chain that comes behind it. So that's one focus area is continuing momentum on the, the, the big items, IPCS, um, Booker, some other big ones. Um, but looking forward, I mean, what's coming in the next year um, is a, a whole nother series of things where we're taking prototypes to production. So for example, uh, PRISM Inc. 1, uh, yeah. we're hoping to get our first production missiles um, imminently. Okay. to actually do our first pull-up test and then start fueling that rapidly. And uh, that particular program, you know, we got a, a, a challenging schedule from the Army yeah. uh, based on the requirement uh, to go really fast. And, yeah. and uh, the team before me came up with the idea of the early operational capability missiles yeah. kind of running in parallel with the big program. Yeah. Um, so great idea. So I think that's going to be a model because uh, okay. Increment 2, for example, um, we want to initiate that program and get it started. But again, we have an aggressive date the Army wants yeah. it by. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, yeah, that's one, for example, uh, the Stinger replacement while also still keeping Stinger production in good shape is another one. Um, and then next year is really when the production ramp ups for Ukraine hit big time. So keeping artillery on track, keeping um, Gimler's on track to get to 14,000 a year, keeping Javelin on track to double to 4,000 a year, um, and everything that goes behind it. So, yeah, 24 will be uh, really a year where um, a lot of the initiatives to scale happen. So okay. that's our that's our focus. I did want to ask about Stinger. I mean, obviously mm -hmm. you're working on a replacement, but that's not going to come overnight. Um, meanwhile, we're sending Stinger to Ukraine. Um, it's it's being used prevalently in. Mm -hmm. in the Army for, say, you know, short-range air defense. Yep. Um, do you have concerns about the supply for Stinger at this point? I mean, are, is, are you able to, I mean, this is a system that you weren't building new ones. Um, right. So how are you managing that supply for Stinger? Well, well, that one in particular, um, first of all, yes, over the past year, a tremendous amount of work has been done by, uh, by Raytheon to uh, reinvigorate that supply chain get the people back. I know they brought people out of retirement who knew how to okay. do things. It's 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 a great weapon. It's just uh, was built in an era when everything was kind of handmade. Yes. So we have what we have. Um, the other part of the effort has been refurbishing. So I visited uh, McAllister uh, uh, Army Depot in, in Oklahoma where yes. we're taking old ones and just improving them and giving them more shelf life, which is another way to pad the stocks. So that's more than a thousand missiles right there. Okay. And uh, Recently, demand from Ukraine has not been as high. We flooded them okay. with a lot. Um, that's tailed off a bit, which has given us a little breathing room okay. to improve our stocks and increase production. But I believe the foreign military sales demand is still very high. Yeah. Um, and uh, so that's what we're trying to posture to do with, with, uh, with Raytheon. But um, it, it's a good example of when, you know, and the, the line wasn't dead. It was just very okay. limited for one customer Lukewarm. The tens a month yeah. versus now we want you know to get up to north of sixty with a path to higher. So okay, all right. Um, shifting over, the army's you know starting to focus on on more things that it may need in, in the Pacific, but also mm -hmm. in Europe. 
Um, both theaters are very important. Um, watercraft in the Pacific mm -hmm. and you know, bridging, you know, for instance, for white gap crossings come to mm -hmm. mind where you know, we have capability, but our capability could probably be better. Mm -hmm. um, so what is the Army doing both the, with both of those areas mm -hmm. in terms of sure. acquisition pathways for modernized capability? So um, on new watercraft, uh, MSVL, um, Maneuver Support Vessel Light, is um, uh, this year has been a big year for it because we got our first one. Um, you know, and like a lot of first of class, like in shipbuilding, you know, costs were higher than expected. Uh, we found all the problems. Um, okay. in building a, a vessel like that. Um, but, uh, and then our, our, our vendor, there were some uh, challenges they had, um, you know, with their parent company that we had to work through. But we're now, I think, clear and running on that one. We, we it took a long time to negotiate the new price. Um, okay. And uh, but that's concluded. We're ready to get into LRIP. So, okay. um, and that, that uh, you know, the demand signal for that vessel, you know, a full company of them is sky high. Yeah. Um, so that's one reason we're willing to take a bit of risk on the on the cost because um, uh, it's the army really wants it. Yeah, you hear a lot and, of commanders talking about that. But the, <laughs> you know the cost increase, I wasn't entirely surprised. I mean, materials cost more, labor costs more, and then on the army side, this is what's yet to come. Uh, you know, requirements drive the cost too. So if the army wants it a certain way and it's harder to build that in a shipyard, well, that adds time and yeah. money. But I think we've got the program in a good place now to hopefully get, hopefully, additional funding um, within the budget for next year okay. to get it on a, a stable production path okay. um, that delivers. Um, bridging's a little easier. It's just, you know, we already had the contracts. We have the programs. Yeah. It's just aligning the money. Um, and uh, the Army made a decision, really, I believe, to add companies, so add engineer companies that do that. Okay. And then the next step is the aligning the budget to actually equip them. Okay. Um, I know that's been a major effort in 25, is just following through on that plan. Okay. As far as I know, we're on track. Okay. It's just finding the money. Yeah. Um, but you know, it's <laughs> but it's a big priority, especially they learned a lot from trying to, you know, moving units around Europe. Yeah. They found all the hard parts. So speaking of finding the money, I mean, we're getting into a, you know, as you talk about needing to ramp up capabilities mm. that we are bringing online. We've developed a lot of systems now. Yep. You know, yep. We're talking numbers. Uh, so how is the Army approaching the, I don't like using the word legacy, you know, but the current, the current fleet that sure. will need to begin that process of phasing out to make room for the new capabilities. So sure. what's the process there at this point in terms of really making the big so, muscle movements on that? So I can give you in uh, kind of conceptually the ideal situation. Okay. Ideally, and actually, one example goes all the way back to M1. We were still producing M60s a couple years into M1 production. That was because we had to be sure that the new production capability was going to be there, that the weapon was effective, but that we retained the industrial base you know, to make the, the weapon. So when you can afford to do so, having some overlap between the old capability coming out and the new one coming in is, is ideal. Um, and in small, you know, in some cases we're, we're able to do that, but it does, it is costly. Um, however, the opposite of that is a numerous year gap between the old thing uh, going out of production and the new thing because uh, you still have the old systems, you still need the parts. So often the supply base for making new vehicles, like a Humvee, for example, um, the supply base that provides the parts to sustain it is the same as the supply base to build new ones. Okay. So uh, that is always the challenge, yeah. and I yeah. think we are, I think we're being smarter about that. Uh, Stinger is an example. Like I said, we're gonna keep that production line uh, hot until yeah. we're into the new one because okay. uh, we don't want the risk. Um, it's really case by case. Okay. But uh, I always prefer to do it the former way I described. Um, however, right now the challenge is budgets get tight. The secretary said, um, you know, the decision space she has and the chief has is. Okay, where to stay on track or accelerate, but then what's going to maybe get slowed down. When we slow something down, uh, it's a conversation with industry uh, to, to truly understand their minimum levels. And, you know, their minimum is not always our minimum, um, but their minimum, for example, still needs to be a viable, you know, profitable thing for them, and that's reasonable. Um, and uh, we need to understand what that is. And that's really just making sure the right people are talking. So uh, uh, I think that's happening. I certainly encourage that. Uh, 
So at least if we make a choice, like Dr. Plant has said, you know, to turn something off, which we don't want to do, at least we know what the risk is we're taking. And I'm not sure that was always the case in the past. We're trying to get better at that. It's not just our budget that matters. It's industries and the supplier, yeah. supplier base, too. Definitely a nuanced and complex process there. It is. Um, the Army's also recently made headway in terms of expanding the load assemble pack for the 155 yes. munition, uh, yep. awarding General Dynamics, American Ordnance LLC contracts yes. to do that job. We also saw a whole slew in the you know over a billion dollar range of other contracts of year, to yep. get after um, other aspects of yes. the 155 millimeter production capabilities. Uh, can you talk a little bit about this effort to expand sure. the, the load assemble and pack process? Yep where those maybe facilities are going and also, sure. uh, you know, other aspects in terms of new contracts that you are yep. currently doing today. Yes. So the approach to the ramp up overall was uh, when we started looking at it, you know, early last year uh, after the war started, um, the thing that takes the longest to facilitize is the metal shells themselves. That's actually making the shells. So we started there. That's where we put the first big asks into Congress that we got support for to start those ramp ups because uh, the long lead item there is the machine tools, the machinery in the factory to make the metal parts. Um, close behind that though is uh, our term load assemble pack. It's, it's in more layman's terms, it's just taking the metal part and actually putting explosives in it in a safe way that uh, is at the quality level we have to have. So what goes behind that though is also buying the explosive fill and producing it. So you have to have the explosives to put in it. Um, that's really been kind of phase two. And some of those awards you saw, uh, the timing was because we needed to ramp up the metal parts first, and now those awards will ideally, if it works, marry up with some, okay. we will, by the time those contracts are ready uh, to execute, you know, on the ground, we'll have the metal parts for them too low. Okay. But we had to do it because Iowa, they do great work at Iowa Ammunition Plant, but we've really maxed it out. Yeah. So that's why we're adding additional locations uh, Arkansas and uh, Kansas, I believe, okay. are where the two sites are. Okay. Um, and so that's exciting. And it's also a good redundancy issue Absolutely. because, you know, having all of that in one building and in one place is risky. Yes, this Absolutely. Is, this is dangerous work. <laughs> yeah. uh, these people are heroes doing it. Yeah. Uh, this will give us a little more uh, uh, way to spread the risk across okay. um, and allow two companies in this case, you know, to innovate and find better ways to do it. The next part, um, the other part of those awards you saw were for the charges to shoot the shells. So yes. the shell itself is one thing, then you have to have the charges to shoot it. Otherwise, it's just a 100-pound explosive thing with it. explosives in it. <laughs> um, and then uh, those contracts are now actually our main effort. So working with Congress again, they approved recently two big items via replenishment funds to facilitate to dramatically increase charge production. Okay. Um, and then uh, we're working on some additional requests to finish that out. That, that again, is going to be at some new places. So um, we are, we are um, spreading that out from where we started. But, um, you know, one's in Canada, one's uh, for a different kind of bag charge, one's in Florida. Okay. Um, so, yeah, it's it, the one thing that we haven't got to yet was fuses, but that's because that was the healthiest Okay. Aspect okay. of the shell. Okay. Um, but so at some point, we may have to do that too. Okay. All so right. it's, it's, I can imagine how it's hard to follow. It's a lot of contracts going a lot of places. Yes. <laughs> yeah, the, the press release that came out was quite jam packed with things. Um, yep. So the service is embarking on human machine integration mm -hmm. efforts. Um, so, from the acquisition perspective, how are you looking at this sort of taking shape? You know, what are some of the things that you think you could rapidly procure sure. that could contribute to this effort? Now. Yeah, one the, the best the exciting thing about it is, I mean, we have robot programs, yeah. but uh, and they're they're actually going well. So the secretary mentioned to SMN and RCV, but uh, the the real uh, brilliance behind the idea, and it wasn't mine, it was really uh, General Rainey uh, working with Rick Toe, um, is we've got to take the next step in how do you what does integrating robots into a formation mean for the formation? Yeah. Is it designed differently? Do you have and you probably do have you know new parts of a formation that are specifically tasked with operating unmanned systems versus being kind of an add-on thing. Yeah. So that's the part that's uh, really exciting. And uh, the hard, the hardest part behind that, uh, you know, spoken to General Rainey, General Rash, as we were embarking, is really moving the data around securely 
uh, to enable um, actually using robots at scale across a big formation. So you may have heard from Project Convergence, you know, we created an air traffic control challenge with just the number of unmanned yeah. systems in the air. Yeah. Um, so we've got to work through how to do that, how to make, in one way it's going to have to be is, uh, right now, like I said, we have robot programs, but they're very much perhaps one soldier controlling one robot, or maybe two controlling yeah. one. Um, the robots themselves have to be smarter. So the AI aspect will be um, absolutely critical. And probably the most important thing is how do you make the platforms themselves more autonomous, but retain human control over lethal force, for example, while letting the robot uh, do the hard part. Um, air is probably easier. Yeah. I mean, so you've probably seen here, I mean, uh, Shield AI, when saw their work they're doing, yeah. they're doing some really great stuff with the Air Force. Um, and talking to us um, on making the aircraft themselves able to do more. Yes. That one is uh, more nimble. Two, uh, you don't jam yourself with just you know, data links to every single thing in the air. We'll jam our own networks. So uh, this, is, this is a necessary step. This, the HMI effort's a necessary step to um, go from just having robots to really robots at scale. What we need out of this effort is um, the right approaches, the right way to do it, and some of the critical techs. And I think industry's already there. I mean, that the innovation in that space is dramatic. They're ready to go. I think if you walk the floor here, you'll find people already doing this. Okay. So we need to leverage what's there. Okay. Um, last question. Sure. With, with what's happening in Israel, you know, how are you mm. thinking about what Israel might need from mm. U.S. Army stuff? And are those things potentially different than what we're supplying to mm. Ukraine? Will there be overlap on what we might need to be providing? And will that result in sort of further strain on the supply uh, that we have um, for various things? So uh, first of all, uh, those conversations about what Israel needs um, are happening above yes. me, of course, um, <laughs> being worked by all the smart people at Policy and Joint Staff <laughs> and the Combatant Command. Um, I, you know, there could be some overlap, sure. Um, but also uh, there might be, for example, Air Force systems they need help with that aren't even Army things, yes. bombs, yeah. precision weapons depending how they choose to do this fight. Um, but we're ready either way. Uh, you know, we, we have maintained stocks ourselves to make, you know, we, we never go to zero. Um, uh, and they are a highly capable military yes, with their own stocks. Uh, they can in-country produce things. Um, that they're one of the few countries that can really make everything for themselves. Yeah. Um, so we may be in a position to help in other ways. For example, they might need more of a certain type of part for them to do final assembly. They might need more explosive material to increase their production of artillery themselves. So okay. we're looking at all aspects of that. I think I think um, it's a bit different than Ukraine where you know they are under attack across their whole country yeah. and including their production capacity. Thankfully, that yeah. hasn't happened yet here. Yeah. Uh, but we're ready to help. I mean, they're, um, the close partnership, uh, the bridges are already there. So um, as soon as I'm told what they need, we will use every trick we have to make it happen. Um, so I think we'll know more soon, uh, but I think they're working through their approach to this fight. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Sure. Hope you enjoy the, the rest of AUSA, Absolutely. the last few hours here, um, and have a great day. Thanks. Great.